So thank you for the invitation. And uh, indeed, I will speak about the role of how many duplicated genes in the development and function of human cortical neurons. And I will start with this picture of a Korska cave near Marseille in France to illustrate the increase of cognitive features in our spaces, such as abstract thinking or language. And these increased cognitive features rely on the evolution of a human brain, which has been so far uh, explained by the increased size of a human brain, the increased size of a cerebral cortex, and the increased complexity of a cerebral cortex into architecture. But few is known about the link between human speciation and divergent neurons themselves, so neuron divergent uh, properties uh, of the neurons themselves. If you compare a human cortical neuron to other species, so other mammals like the mouse, other primates such as a macaque, or other great apes or hominids such as the chimpanzee, human neurons display a, a bigger morphology. So the neurons are, are bigger, they're also more complex. If you look at the synapse themselves, they display an increased density and bigger dendritic spines that are the postsynaptic structures of these neurons. And they also display divergent physiological properties, so divergent uh, electrophysiological properties. One of these divergent uh, property, uh, physiological property, is neuronal excitability. So if you compare a human neurons to all the mammalian cell, uh, species, like the mouse or the macaque, human neurons are less excitable compared to other species. And this is assessed by uh, injecting current in the, in the cortical neurons and looking at the firing rate, so the frequency of action potentials. And doing so, you can assess the excitability of the neurons. And doing so, human neurons are less excitable compared to other species. So all these morphological and physiological divergent properties, uh, we know actually quite a few, uh, we have few data to understand the underlying mechanisms of these divergent features. Work of uh, the last years showed that if you compare the cerebral cortex between many mammalian species, um, actually the, 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 the number of cell types, uh, the situ architecture of, uh, of the cerebral cortex uh, is quite conserved between mammalian species. But yet you have the same type of neurons but they express differently genes. So we, you will have some conserved genes between species, which enable us to, to, to map the cell types between species, but they also express differently genes with human-specific genes, mammal-specific genes, and mouse-specific genes uh, in this diagram. And this divergence in gene expression rely on the gene uh, regulatory network evolution. But there is another source of molecular novelty, which is gene duplication. So gene duplication occurs when you have an ancestral gene which is shared between, for instance, all mammals, and, it, and which is duplicated in the great apes or in human, leading to two genes, the ancestral one, and a new gene. So this gene can be, stay as this, and you will have redundancy between the two copies, or you can also have mutation in the new gene, which either lead to pseudogenization or speciation. And so basically, you can have duplicated genes that undergo a modification that subset their new function. You have new genes which are some new function in the human species. And work in the previous work in the Pierre Van Hagen lab highlighted by during corticogenesis, you have at least 30 gene family of duplicated genes that are dynamically expressed during the corticogenesis. Some of these genes may are expressed early during corticogenesis, so they may account for in the increased size of the cerebral cortex and of the brain. But all the genes may are expressed lately, so they may account for divergences in the neurons themselves in their function and development. And among these late expressed duplicated genes uh, is LRC37B that I will focus on today. So what about this LRC37 gene family? So the gene, uh, the gene family uh, appeared in uh, amniotes, and all amniotes have at least one gene, which is LRC37A, so the ancestral gene. And then you have an expansion of the number of genes in the primates, with each species or genus having its own number of genes. So the macaque has, has three encoding LRC37 uh, genes, 
the chimpanzee has three also, and the human four. Four with three of the A type, so the ancestral type, and one uh, LRC plus seven B, which arose uh, in the great apes. Um, so why they have this complicated name? So uh, they are transmembrane receptor, so they are called at the membrane, and they carry in the extracellular part leucine rich repeats. So that's why they are named LRR something. So, and while the ancestral type LRC37A is a long receptor, LRC37B, so the, the new gene in hominids, is shorter in, in, in L terminus and C terminus, and also acquired a new domain, an LB specific uh, domain. So this is data in, in, in the genome. If you look at the, at the human population itself, so in the 1000 genome uh, genomes, uh, you can see that you have the high variability in the number of copies for the ancestral gene LRC37A and one duplicate LRC37A2. Because with duplicated genes, they have the ability to be duplicated again or deleted again. And it looks like that the ancestral gene, we all, almost are losing it because we have between two, uh, zero and two copies in our genome. LRC37A2 is very viable. But two duplicates, LRC37A3 and B, the one we will speak today, are extremely fixed in the human population. We all have two copies, meaning that we may have a strong um, pressure, pressure on these genes uh, and that we are not allowed to have a variability in the, the, the copy numbers. At the transcriptomic level, if you look in the cerebral cortex of a human species, this gene, LRC37B, A2, and A3, are mostly neuronal genes uh, enriched uh, in glutamatergic uh, neurons. So basically, we have a gene family which is expanded in hominids. Uh, some of them are fixed in the human population, among them LRC37B, and they are enriched in glutamatergic neurons of the cerebral cortex. What about the expression at the protein level? So I perform on cortical sex from human individuals, staining for LRC37B in red and NQNG in blue, the marker of the axon initial segment. And as you can see, uh, LRC37B in red um, is expressed, is co-localized with NQNG. So it's a receptor which is localized at the axon initial uh, segment. Uh, and as you can see also, it's not all axon initial segments that are positive for LRC37B, but a subset uh, of them. So what the axon initial segment? This is a critical subcellular compartment um, and which for um, proteated sodium channels, which are generating the axon potentials. So this critical compartment generates the axon potential, so the output of the neurons. And so it uh, play a key role uh, in the excitability uh, of the neurons, but also uh, the computation. So this staining of LRC37B co-localization with Ankylin G, I performed it in individuals from birth uh, to more than 60 years old. Um, and I looked at the proportion of AIS axonicial segments that are positive for LRC37B. And as you can see here, I cannot detect LRC37B in neonates. I have an increased proportion of positive AIS during childhood. And from puberty, we have between 35 and 60% uh, of the AIS that are positive for LRC37B. So this is Newman. Uh, what about all the species? Uh, so if you look at the transcript level, the mouse doesn't express any LRC37 gene, while the macaque and the human will express all their encoding parallels. Interestingly, if you compare the autologue LRC37B uh, expression between chimpanzee and human, you have an increased expression at the transcript level uh, in human compared to chimpanzee. What about at the protein level? So I perform similar stainings uh, in human, chimpanzee, macaque, and mouse, in all these species, I can detect and Kirinji, the marker of the action initial segment, but I can detect only LRC37B in human, not in the three other species. So this was expected in mouse because it doesn't carry a B type LRC37, but this would have been expected in macaque and chimpanzee, which carry a B type uh, LRC37 uh, receptor, and even the chimpanzee, which carry an autolog gene for LRC37B. So it looks like that LRC37B 
is a human-specific receptor at the axon initial segment of cortical pyramidal nerves. So what can be the function of lrc segment b there? To answer this question, uh, we use an approach of gain of function in the mouse uh, cerebral cortex by initiate operation, leading to an expression of lrc segment b cDNA in the cortical pyramidal neurons of the mouse. And this led to an expression of lrc segment b uh, enriched at the axon initial segment, so as we, uh, we saw uh, in the human cerebral cortex. And what's the role of this? So we perform several uh, electrophysical recordings uh, in these neurons, and the striking, the most important uh, phenotype that we observed was a decreased excitability. So lrc b positive neurons were less excitable than the control neurons. And so this was quite interesting because we saw in the introduction that human neurons are uniquely less excitable than the other mammalian species. And here we add in the mouse neurons a hominin specific gene and we have a decreased excitability. So what can be the underlying mechanism of action of lrc 7 b So lrc 7 receptor family is an orphan family, no ligand is known. Uh, so far. So we had to have an unbiased approach to understand the role of uh, the molecular mechanism of action of lrc 37 b And to do so, one approach was to perform an ELISA assay targeting uh, 920 transplant brain or secreted protein, um, among them protein enriched at the axon initial segment and in chandelier interneurons that are targeting the axon initial segment. And basically among these 920 transplant brain or secreted proteins, only one was positive and replicated a secreted FGF13A uh, protein. So in Hexel, in, in a heterologous system, I use several mutant forms for lrc 37 b uh, with or without several domains. Uh, and so basically in this system, the full lrc 37 b can co-immunoprecipitate FGF15, but a version without velocin retrepeat cannot bind. And if you express only velocin retrepeat, you can bind FGF15. And so basically velocin retrepeat are sufficient and necessary to bind FGF15. We also used, um, uh, biophysical approaches, which show that lrc b is binding directly to FGF13. And we also assess whether FGF13 could bind the channel, which is at the axon initial segment, and actually it does uh, directly bind to the channel. So we have this model in which lrc b is binding to FGF13A, which is also binding to the voltage gated sodium channel. If we prefer in the mouse neurons, which overexpress lrc B staining for these three proteins, NAV channels, lrc 7 b and FGF13A, we can see that they are all concentrated at the same place at the axon initial segment. So they are all together at the axon initial segment. And FGF13A, which is an AIS-like protein, which is an AIS protein in the mouse, is enriched in lrc 7 b expressed neurons. So we concentrate FGF13 in these neurons. And so basically, we wanted to know the role of FGF13. When we apply it on mouse cortical section, we decrease their excitability, not copying the gain of function of lrc 7 b So lrc 7 b is concentrating FGF13, which is decreasing the neuronal uh, excitability. So everything here was in mouse or in hexes. We wanted to know in human what's happening. So we used uh, human cerebral cortex section uh, biopsies from the patients that are in a hospital in our campus. We perform first immunoprecipitation of the NAV channel that are the essential segment, and we can co-immunoprecipitate lrc b and FGF13A, recapitulating that in human, they are bound together from the same complex. And we also recorded these neurons, cortical pyramidal neurons, uh, with post-hoc staining for lrc b to have the information whether they express or not lrc 7 b at the axon initial segment. And so basically the positive cortical pyramidal neurons for lrc 7 b were less excitable than the negative one, recapitulating the results we had before um, in the mouse. So in conclusion, we identify a new receptor at the axon initial segment, uniquely expressed in the human species, not in others, which is leading to a decreased excitability of these neurons. And we deorphanize this lrc 7 family, finding that they bind lfgf 13 a to velocin retrepeat, which decreases the excitability of the neurons through the voltage gated sodium channels. And lrc 7 reacts to concentrating lfgf 13 a at the axon initial segment of these neurons. And so to end, I would like to thank people in the Pierre van der Hagen's lab, 
Yeah, please. From uh, monitoring Amelie Lejeune, Emirer Kohl, Sophie Burkus, Byron, Angeline Bileu for their help, all the people in KU Leuven of VIB uh, for the electrophysiology and uh, biophysics approaches, the surgeon Tom Tate with whom we're collaborating to get uh, cortical biopsies, and banks to get uh, tissues for human and non human um, person. Thank you. Thank you so much, Baptiste, for an exciting seminar. Um, I encourage everybody to, to start putting their questions in the Q&A box. Uh, while, while you're all starting to, to do so, let me, let me start off with um, a question. I was curious um, if there are any evolutionary modifications to FGF 13A that you've observed that might suggest some you know, convergence in this pathway. Yes, so it's a question we ask ourselves so far, it was not striking that FGF13A evolved or diverged uh, in humans. Actually, if we look at the binding site that we identified uh, in FGF13A, so binding um, LR637B and the channel, so the first exon, the exon S, uh, is extremely conserved uh, in amniotic species. So probably um, this is already extremely conserved because it's already binding to the voltage gated sodium channels very early on, first. And secondly, all the amniotes, they have an LRC part of an aging, which is expressed in all organs. So maybe the interaction between the LRC part of an A's and fgf 13 a is quite an ancestral interaction. And here in, in human, we just bring LRC part of an B and fgf 13 a in the cortical pyramid neuron at the actual initial segment. So no, there is no divergence in human at the molecular level, but this could be explained because the interaction is quite ancient. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Uh, one other one other question I have is you, your group has. Um, uh, let me let me take this question and then I will come back and ask my question if it's not answered. <laughs> so we have um, a question from Su Yi Huang um, who says, "Fantastic talk. Does." LRRC37A bind to FGF13A or sodium channels as well. What has diverged after the duplication event in hominids? Okay, thank you for the question. So, indeed, as explained, so we saw that LRC37B and LR37A types both bind to FGF13A. So, this interaction is quite ancient. FGF13A is binding to the channel directly. Uh, and it's probably quite ancient or so because these channels are quite uh, conserved, pluton spaces. The LRC37 receptors are not directly binding to the channel. So this is not some, something which never happened uh, with this receptor. So what's new uh, in human? So if you look at this B type, which is long, uh, so LRC37B, which is specific in great apes, it's acquired a new domain, the LB specific domain, that you cannot find in the ancestral type, the LRC37A type. And we found, I didn't show it today, that it's binding an over transmembrane protein, NCN1B, which is also enriched at the axon initial segment. So it might be that this duplicate, acquiring this new domain and binding to NCN1B, acquired the ability to be enriched at the axon initial segment, because NCN1B is shown to, uh, to enable to target channels, for instance, at the axon initial segment. So maybe the novelty is the location to be at the axon initial segment. On one hand, on the other hand, the novelty is the expression, because as I've showed you in mouse, we don't have expression of any receptor uh, in the cerebral cortex. In the chimpanzee, we have a lower expression of the B type compared to the human. So probably, in addition of the the coding sequences, we have mutation or changes in the regulatory elements, which enrich the expression for LRC plus seven B in the human uh, cortical pyramid neurons. Great. So we have another question from Mari Sepp, who asks, who says, thank you for the great talk. Do you know if overexpression of LLR, LRRC 37B paralogs has a similar effect on neuronal excitability? Yes. So LRC 37B human has an autologous in the chimpanzee, not in, in the macaque. So it's a, a, a great F specific uh, family. We did, uh, we have done overexpression of LRC 37B chimpanzee form in the mouse. It is also going to the axon initial segment. It is also binding in the same way to FGF13A and to SCN1B. So at this level, no difference. 
we haven't recorded uh, elect elect electrophysical properties. So I don't know if they also lead to a decrease in stability, but it's quite likely that it is also decreasing the neuronal stability. That said, we don't detect the protein in the cheap and disable cortex. So even though it could have the same properties, the, pro the protein is not there in the, in the cheap enzyme. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Baptiste, for, for a really exciting um, seminar. And uh, we're gonna move on to the next speaker.